Thank you for being here. I have been looking forward to this talk and to meeting um, Daphne and having all of you meet her uh, since I knew she was coming. Um, she's a family physician, she's a writer, and she teaches at, um, in the Department of Family Medicine, uh, UC San Francisco. But first and foremost, I think it's, it's just striking to note that she's a doc. She sits in her office three days a week and sees a patient all day long from birth to age 102. Um, and she takes care of them. And she's the first doc I've taken around Google, and I've taken many doctors around who said, let me take a picture of the size of your desserts, and let me take the picture of the size of the cheese you're serving, because I want to show my patients how small you're serving them. This is how she cares uh, about her patients and about their health, and she, she prescribes good eating, among other things. And as she said to me at lunch, if you care about your food, you ultimately have to find out and care about how it is grown and where it comes from. So um, I'm, I'm so excited for her to come and talk to us to make this connection between our natural world, what's, what's grown, how it's grown, and, and how that connects with our health. I'm, I'm um, talked to quite often by people who say, there's health, tell me what I should eat uh, and what's good for me, and, and then tell me about what's good for the environment. They have nothing to do with each other. And to me, they have everything to do with each other. And, and I think Daphne's gonna talk to us about that, among other things. So um, I, she's also a, a writer. She's a columnist for the Washington Post and, and um, in the health section, and uh, she's got these two books. Pharmacology just came out. Um, very excited to, to see it and to hear about it. But I love, I, I thought I'd end by reading to you some of the titles of articles that she's written. Uh, Locavorism versus Salmonella. Take a hike and call me in the morning. Prescribing food. Farm fresh goat milk lattes. And to me, the, this is the fascinating thing about her. She is comparing small farm, family farms, which I consider to be pretty, in pretty fragile state, um, to integrative medicine, medicine for the whole person, and, and learning, drawing lessons from farming when both of them are things that are really kind of edgy. So I can't wait to hear more. Please welcome Daphne. For me. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. I have to tell you guys that you're kind of like my lucky penny because five years ago when Jungle Effect, my last book, came out, it was at Google that I gave one of the first talks and that book went on to do quite well. And once again, this is one of the very first talks that I'm giving on pharmacology, so you, I, maybe I need to rub all of you afterwards. So I'm going to tell you a story about soil and your health today. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got on into all this in the first place. Maybe one way to illustrate it would be to tell you about a conversation I had with a reporter a couple weeks ago. This was a reporter that was interviewing me about the book. And at the end of the interview, he told me about something that he'd seen down at Stanford at their new technologies, cool new um, inventions expo. And what it was, was a box. And you could buy a cartridge, just like you can for a printer. And the cartridge contained a plant and soil and a computer chip. And you would put it in the box and shut the lid and push the button and you would get a plant. And the inventors who were, they're actually on Kickstarter, were saying this is great. Now anybody can be a gardener or a farmer. And the interviewer wanted to know what I thought about this. Well, 
the geek in me thinks it's pretty darn cool. You know, the, what is that computer chip doing? And all you have to do is add water. Are you serious? And the, this plant grows on your counter, and you need light, but you don't even really need sunlight. And you know, I was like on my phone trying to find the website and everything. But the healer in me had some real hesitations. How do we think that we can reduce something so complicated, something that nature does with so many elements as growing our food down to a cartridge and push the button in a computer chip? It's the same hesitancy I have when I think, how can we reduce something so complicated as depression down to one neurotransmitter? or diabetes down to one hormone, or cancer down to one missing piece of DNA, or one excessive piece of DNA. And in fact, it is exactly that concern about the reductionism that sent me out of my medical office to learn from sustainable farmers. Because from my vantage point, I actually saw them as being professionals who were in charge of healing an entire system, but had thought about all those pieces, sun, moon, bugs, rain, and brought them all together to make something grow. And that was what I was interested in doing in my medical practice, is that kind of complexity thinking. So that was one of the first things that started me looking outside of the eight by 10 walls of my medical practice. It was also my interest in food, and as Liv said, you talk about food long enough, you have to start to wonder where it comes from, and you have to start to get beyond those words like organic or GMO. These are just kind of labels. You just have to understand what's really happening behind all that. But I'd be misrepresenting myself if I told you that I had no background in agriculture. In fact, I was conceived on a farm. That, that might be too much information. You guys are just getting to know me here. But uh, my parents were part of the back to the land kibbutz movement. They moved from a small town outside of Massachusetts to Israel in 1964. And uh, they were living in a little tiny shack on the kibbutz. I guess when you're living in a single bed, the next thing is you have a kid. I don't know. But um, my mother found out very quickly that children on a kibbutz are raised just like the chickens. They're basically kept in a separate coop. And she decided she did not want a communal child. So I was not born on the farm, but I have my roots on the farm. But I was on this farm, and that's me that you see in the corner. And this is a picture that was actually sent to me very recently when the farmer's daughter found out that I was writing this book. But this is a piece of land in upstate New York that my parents bought when they moved back to the States. They actually, it was 150 acres, and I think they bought it with their stipend from graduate school at that time. But this was an introduction to agriculture, but I don't know if any of you grew up on a farm or do some farming now. Is there anybody in the room who is connected in any way to the land? OK, we have even gardeners. You count. If you have a little box out there, that counts. OK, wonderful. Everybody in the room. Well, this kind of farming, I, I think you see what's happening with the soil here. It's being turned upside down so that all that little architecture of bugs and roots and all these things that nourish plants on the top are actually being turned deep down into the earth where they can't do very much. But this was kind of what farming had turned to in the late 1960s when I'm standing there in the corner. Um, my next experience with farming actually happened in medical school, where my best friend, it turns out, in medical school was a goat farmer from Mendocino. And he'd been homeschooled all the way until college. And we would sit in the back of the lecture hall, and the professors would flash these images or slides of diseases up. And he would sit next to me and say, my goats get that. Or, you know, I know exactly how that works because I've taken care of it for years and my goats. And it was fascinating to me that he was way more advanced of a healer than I was because of his experience on the farm. And that stuck with me. So then my next experience with farming, I'm giving you sort of my background in farming, was as an intern in the Salinas Valley. I went from Harvard Medical School, which was sort of this, you know, tertiary care, hyper-reductionist, focused specialty training to a family medicine training in the Salinas Valley. And there I took care of farm workers. 
And it was the first time in my life that I saw something called organophosphate poisoning, which was a pesticide that's now illegal, but then in the early 1990s was still being used all the time in the fields. And I remember one of my first times in the ER being on call and this woman coming in pregnant, her fingers stained black from picking berries, seizing from organophosphate poisoning. And the, the, I saw an array of fetal malformations in their busy obstetrics ward that I hadn't seen during my previous training. And so there it was really the dark side of farming that I was exposed to. But my real interest in farming probably happened the same time as all of you, in that I started to become interested in sustainable food, in this fantastic movement of you know, knowing your farmer and going to the farmer's market and um, hearing about young idealists, people in their 20s and 30s who were giving up their fancy educations and going back to the land and starting to grow uh, vegetables, veritable vegetables. And I heard these stories, and here I was as a family doctor in medicine, wondering, when are people going to be clamoring for their medicine to have a face, the way they're clamoring for their food to have a face? And when are we going to get these same idealists who are pouring into health and healing and wanting to be primary care doctors the same way they want to be farmers, underpaid primary care doctors? And I'm still waiting for that movement to happen. But that is why one of the reasons I started to look at this paradigm of complexity and sustainable farming. But then, the more I started to learn about farming, the more I realized that farmers and I have the same patients. <laughs> I started to look at actually what they do on a given day. And you have to squint a little bit here, OK? But if you do, it's amazing the levels of the structures, the way actually that they work and that the nutrients are moved from top to bottom. And look at those hairs. Their hair follicles look surprisingly like soil. I mean, there is a pattern here that repeats itself not just between the skin and the soil, but between the intestinal lining in the soil and the pulmonary tree in the soil. And then you start to look on the electron microscope level. Can you guess which one of these is the villi in our intestine interacting with microbes and nutrients? And which one is roots interacting with microbes and nutrients? Can you guess? Don't read the bottom. Yeah. You cheated already. <laughs> but hard to tell, right? So the one on your left is the intestine, and these are the intestinal villi, and this is the glycan, the nutrients that are being processed and brought in. And this is the same with the rhizosphere, with the roots from plants. And it works the same. The organic matter comes in, the microbes process it, they put it into these perfect packages, and then it gets absorbed through these finger-like projections, whether it be in your gut or in the soil. And then I started to learn that the ideal pH of soil and the ideal pH of our bodies are pretty much exactly the same. And the carbon to nitrogen ratio of soil and the carbon to nitrogen ratio that makes up our being is darn similar. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, and I feel pretty stupid that it took all these years for it to dawn on me as a physician, but you know all those carbohydrates and fats and proteins that make up our body? Where do they come from? They come from the soil via our food. In fact, it's not too much of a stretch to say that we are soil. And when I started to think about what that meant, all of a sudden my exploration took on sort of two levels of meaning. There was the model for farming that interested me as a doctor. And then there was the practice, these things that I could actually learn that I call farm to body lessons, that I could go out and bring my patients so that they could be healthier. And pharmacology is sort of the culmination of all that. It's a whole series of lessons from everything from 
uh, um, laying egg farm and what it can teach us about different kinds of stress, to a cow-calf farm and what it can teach us about super immunity or how to build our um, resistance, to an aromatic herb farm that teaches us actually how plants have special messages for our metabolism and our body. But I'm going to tell you one story today. And as I said at the beginning, it is the story about soil and us. And it starts actually with this farmer here, Eric Hawkinson, and his wife, Wendy. Eric was actually not married to Wendy when he bought his 12 acres of land in the Snoqualmish Valley in Washington State. He bought it in the late 1980s after having a varied career. Uh, unlike a lot of farmers, he wasn't born into farming. He actually had gone to Yale Divinity School for a while. And uh, then he became a salmon fisherman up in Alaska. But then in the late 1980s, he wanted to fulfill a lifelong dream. And he bought 12 acres in the Snoqualmish. And his goal, as he explained to me, was that he wanted to grow vegetables that had nutritional punch. But as he started to farm the land and plant his crops and see what he was getting, he realized that, in fact, his soil was depleted. It was tired. It had no more nutrients in it. And now from what you've just learned, when your soil is depleted, that means that your vegetables are not going to have nutritional punch. And so he was a smart man, a learned man. So he went to the agronomy books. He went to the agricultural science textbooks. And he started to learn about how to replenish his soil. And he learned about what is called testing and replacing, where basically you go around your property and you take samples in each one of the fields that you're planning to grow your vegetables in. And then you take these samples, and much like a test tube, like you would with your blood when you go to the lab, and you send it off to a central lab that's an agronomy lab. And they send you back something that looks very much like this, very much like the reports that I get in my office for my patients. And it tells you, you get one for each area that you've sampled, and it tells you if you have too much of a mineral or too little of a mineral. It also tells you how much to replace it. And so Eric took all this information, being the dutiful farmer, and he started to follow directions. So I'm going to actually take a second and just read you a tiny excerpt from the book about this. And it's Eric talking to me. I spent days following up on those computer readouts. I used my John Deere cone spreader and ended up putting thousands of pounds of minerals all on my 12 acres. He was not exaggerating. I estimated from the reports that in the years Eric used the agricultural testing services, he'd spread more than 50 tons of imported minerals over his land. But somehow it didn't feel right. There were lots of minerals that I wasn't sure where they were from. They were probably taken from developing countries where their soil needed these minerals more than we do. And I was also wondering, if these are all so good for my plants, why does the manufacturer recommend that I wear a mask while I'm spreading them? <laughs> Plus, despite all his efforts, Eric was not seeing the miraculous improvements that he'd hoped for. He said, I couldn't help thinking, yeah, I'm putting these minerals on the soil, but are they really getting to the plant? And if I happen to put down a little too much of one thing, what did it do to all the other nutrients? I'd heard stories about how adding too much of one can lock up other elements. This could create soil conditions that were even worse than when I started. So I'm sitting there at Eric's dining room table, and he's telling me the story. And as he's talking, all of a sudden, I flash onto a patient that I had seen in my office a week before coming to his farm to do this internship. And her name was Allie. I kind of changed her name for the book. It wasn't really Allie, but we'll call her Allie. And she's pretty typical for my practice. She was a woman in her 30s who the best word I can find to describe her was depleted, just like Eric Soil. And she had had some intense things happen in her life. Her business had gone awry. Her father had gotten very sick. She had been doing a lot of traveling for her work. And she started to get very fatigued. And she was going around and seeing various physicians and also seeing other healers. 
And each time she would go and see someone, what would they do? They would test her. And then they would get the readouts, and they would replace her. And she was starting to be this pharmacopoeia of both of prescription medicines and also supplements. Meantime, her digestion was going to pot. She was just feeling terrible. There was like this limited diet that she could eat of, you know, she'd get those bag things of spinach and steam them because she knew she needed some kind of vegetable in her diet. And then she would survive on energy bars. They were the only other thing that would make her feel good. And so she came to me as sort of this last ditch resort, uh, you know, in desperation and wanted to find out what I recommended for her. So this is a description of my first visit with Allie. If Allie were sitting at the table listening to Eric, I'm certain that she would nod her head in agreement. To her first appointment in my office, she'd brought in not only her thick file of test results, but also two shopping bags filled with prescription pills and over-the-counter supplements. One by one, she unpacked them onto my desk in the neighboring bookshelf until my little exam room looked more like a vitamin shop than a doctor's office. The pharmaceuticals I could recognize right away, a proton pump inhibitor for her stomach, an antispasmodic for her lower abdominal cramps, an antidepressant for her mood, an antihistamine for her allergies. <laughs> But a good proportion of the bottles in Allie's pharmacy were labeled with vague names like Vital Force or Woman's Thrive rather than a specific nutrient. And when I read the fine print, I saw that some nutrients reappeared on a multitude of bottles. For example, I found five supplements that contained zinc and four others that listed vitamin A or its metabolite retinoic acid. Looking at this impressive array, it was not too much of a stretch to think of Allie as locked up. Indeed, any drug or supplement can have unintended effects, and humans, like soil, can become deficient in one nutrient as a result of having too much of another. For instance, excess calcium can create zinc and iron deficiencies in humans. Interestingly enough, Eric told me that excess phosphate in the soil can create the same deficiencies in plants. I wondered how many adverse interactions might be taking place in Allie's fragile system because of all the drugs and supplements she was taking. So back to Eric, I asked him, so what did you do to make this beautiful land that I've been farming for the past couple days um, as I was sitting at the table? And he told me the story about how he actually ended up rejuvenating his land. He went back to the books. But this time, he didn't go to your standard agronomy books. He went to books by the grandmothers and grandfathers of organic agriculture, people whose names you might recognize, like Rudolf Steiner and F.H. King and Lady Balfour and Sir Albert Howard. These are people who wrote about organic farming very early on and influenced people like the modern day Michael Pollan. Um, these are what, uh, the original organic agricultural philosophers. And how did they get their opinions? They got them from watching traditional farmers farm on the land. Farmers who had been farming a piece of land and received it from their parents and their great-grandparents and their great-great-grandparents and planned to hand it down to their children and their grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren. And so they had found a system of preserving the soil and preserving fertility on the land. And it didn't matter if they were in China, like F.H. F. King wrote about China, or if they were in Germany and Bavaria, like Rudolf Steiner, who wrote about Germany and Bavaria, or India, like Sir Albert Howard. What they were all doing was pretty much the same. They were farming in the image of nature. They were farming the way that nature farms. And that means, how does nature farm? Nature farms with animals, not just with plants. Animals are there to replenish the soil. Think of a natural setting like a forest. How does it happen? The animals are part of that ecosystem. Nature always keeps ground cover. Have you ever been to a place in nature in the wild where you just see bare soil? 
There's always something that's protecting it and preserving the moisture. Nature doesn't till the way you saw in that first picture, where you take that delicate top layer and stick it down low where it can't do anything to nourish the plants. Nature doesn't use chemical additives. Nature conserves water. Nature uses seeds that were grown in that place because they're intended to be there, not seeds that are actually refined for a distant land or that have another gene introduced in them, as we're seeing now. So Eric became very influenced by these writings. And he, too, started to farm. And what he, his method is called biodynamic farming. But it really is this full cycle of farming in the image of nature. And what he did by doing this is he started to nourish those tr all of those microbes and all of those worms and all of those voles, the little rodents that live under the soil, which are there to process that organic matter. And they, in, two, these, in turn, these billions of unpaid workers began to nourish his plants. And he started to grow the most amazing grass because he would rotate the animals through. I mean, what better fertilizer than a cow, right? They deposit it, and then they plow it in with their hooves, and then they move on. And they'll also you know, disturb the top layer just enough that you start to get a little system going on there. So does that grass look pretty good to you guys? I mean, I know you're not necessarily experts, but wouldn't you say that's pretty good looking grass? Yeah, good grass. Um, and then he started to grow amazing vegetables. And he's just this uh, very, very popular farmer up in the Snoqualmish. But the true test is that about eight to 10 years into having given up that test and replace and changing his soil, he went back and he did those soil samples. And he sent them back into the lab. And the results came back that everything was perfect. And he hadn't bought an outside additive in almost a decade. So his new system was really working. So I'm sitting there as a doctor at the dining room table after having done a hard day's labor in his field. And I'm thinking, how does this apply to Allie, my patient? Here she is in San Francisco suffering, eating her energy bars and her wilted spinach from Costco, but, and you know, eating her bags of medicines every day. Can I make the leap? Can we start to say that when Allie enters an eco-cycle, that she too can get healthier, just like his vegetables, and just like the cows, and just like the worms, and just like Eric and Wendy reported for themselves and their farm interns? What would happen to Allie? So I'm a woman of science, so I started to go to the literature to see what happens. I mean, we have all this data now telling us that if it is a biodynamically rich soil, if there's a lot of worms and a lot of microbes that are just teeming in that soil, and there's a lot of actual DNA in the soil, that you grow a more nutrient-rich and more varied crop. Can you guys tell which is the, the, the biodynamically rich soil here, just from looking at this slide? This was published in, a, what's your guess? The one on the left. Yeah, see, and you're not a farmer, right? You could just tell. If you just even looked, not at the greenery, but at the soil itself, what do you see that's different? How would you describe the two soils? Happy. Moist. Rich. Yeah, there's something about it that feels pliable, like it can give, like it, it can allow earth to come through. You're not going to believe this, but as a doctor, when I look at my patients, I apply a lot of these same values. This is what you learn is that recognized, you know, healthy sick. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was fascinating for me to see that, you know, I had this language actually in common with farmers, our ability to sort of evaluate things. But we have a lot of data now showing us that microbes in the soil and this rich soil have everything to do with the value of the nutrients that come out of it. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the study that came out of Stanford about nine months ago saying that organic is no better than conventional. That's because they were asking the wrong question. If they'd been asking about the soil, because there's many organic soils that look like that. In fact, that's an organic soil. If they were asking it, does microbial rich soil and well cared for eco soil like Eric's produce healthier vegetables? Their study would have had a totally different result 
Isn't it amazing in science if you ask the wrong question? You really go down the rabbit hole. But so we have lots of information about this. This is not disputed at this point. But what we don't understand, and we have lots of information that nutrient-rich foods makes for healthy people. We have that information too. But we haven't completed the arc from soil to our bodies. How do we relate to soil? What happens if I put Ali in that eco-cycle? What happens if I put you in that eco-cycle to your health? And these are the kinds of cross-disciplinary, big picture questions that we need to start asking and not get caught in our click and grow bubble, you know, of putting the plant in the box or the human on the drug. So I went, I called lots of scientists. I asked them this question, what happens to us when we get connected to healthy soil? Can we actually turn our health around? And most of them, there was science, uh, silence at the end of the phone. I talked to people in health. I talked to people in ag agronomy. But one day, I called Justin Sonnenberg. And he's a microbiologist at Stanford. Do you recognize his slide there on his desktop? You saw that earlier, right? That's the one I showed you of the, the, the human gut. What Justin and his wife Erica do, they're a team in their lab. And they study the microbiome, which is that massive colony of bacteria that lives in our intestine. Two pounds of us is bacteria that we don't own in terms of it not being part of our DNA, but that we're discovering more and more has everything to do with our health. It has to, to do with our propensity for allergies. It has to do with our level of immunity. It has to do with our metabolism. It might even have to do with whether we are you know, heavy or thin. These are all things that are related to the microbiome. And if you're interested in reading more, uh, Mother Jones has a fantastic article that just came out, I think, last week that's specifically on it. It's one of the best pieces I've seen. But there's more and more coming out about how much these little bugs in our gut sort of rule our health. And um, what we're discovering is that a certain percentage of these we inherit, the same way we inherit property or our grandmother's candlesticks. You know, they come to us within our family lineage. But there's another percentage of them that we get from our environment. And we get from a variety of places, including the places where our food is grown the soil and water. Water is, you know, the oceans are where our food is grown as well. Sometimes we don't think of that as the water equivalent of soil, but it is. And so Justin said, you know, we're just starting to discover how the microbes, those microbes that Eric is growing in his soil, interact with our microbiome and what effect that's having on our health and that that might explain at least a good part of what happens to someone like Allie in terms of her health when she enters the farm cycle. But I'm just going to share with you some of the research that's coming out of this. And it's, this is new stuff, guys. This is, you know, I've gone from ancient farmers to, you know, sort of cutting, cutting edge microbiology here. But um, what we're starting to discover, and this is a study that just came out a couple months ago, is that when your food is grown in soil that's been mistreated, it's been dosed with antibiotics and pesticides and fertilizers. The bacteria that's encouraged to grow in that soil, first of all, it becomes very monotonous. You don't get the huge variety that you got in that slide that you appreciate. You tend to get fewer types of bacteria. And they develop antibiotic resistance. And then what happens is they hitchhike on your food into your gut. And they give information, sometimes it's just a segment of DNA, to your microbiome. And they actually can convert good guys. They can convert the nice candlesticks that you got from your grandmother into antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And so we're starting to discover that you, you know, we've, we've known that when you dose animals with antibiotics, that that affects your, your, your own resistance antibiotics. We're starting to discover that soil is a whole other piece of this. And we just don't even know what other kind of negative information can come in from having your food grown in negative soil. They're just starting to code these strands and figure out what this little invisible exchange is that's happening. So now I've told you the bad news, but the good news, and this is a piece that Justin wrote, it's about 
research that researchers in France did. But we're discovering that good information gets transferred as well. So this is about a study that was done where researchers went and looked at a bacteria that lives on seaweed in the ocean. And this bacteria has a sequence of DNA in it that's really good at digesting seaweed and processing those nutrients and using it. And it's a bacteria that's called a Bactroidetes type bacteria. And so now that we can sequence the entire genome and we're starting to be able to sequence the entire biome, they went in and they started to look at where they could find that, that enzyme that digests the seaweed in terms of all living species. And they found it in the intestines of cultures that eat a lot of seaweed. And so what happened is that that bacteria passed its DNA on, it hitchhiked on the seaweed into the microbiome of these seaweed-eating cultures. And as a result, they have a better ability than non-seaweed-eating cultures to digest seaweed and harvest its nutrients. They have these special bacteroidetes that are sort of like seaweed gluttons and that give them all these great nutrients from seaweed that let's say if your family grew up for you know, centuries in Eastern Europe, you don't have that ability. And as Justin Sonnenberg said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. How much of this information, this past the gene game is happening between us and our soil at every given meal, we're just starting to discover. I'm not going to load you with a bunch of this new research, but I need to tell you this other study because I just love it. This is um, Italian researchers who went to a tiny village in Burkina Faso and actually, <laughs> it's kind of a weird study, they took a group of healthy children in the village and collected stool samples from them and studied the bacterial content of their stool. And then they went and compared these stool samples the bacterial colonies in it, to a sample from kids who were living in downtown Florence. And I don't know if any of you have been to Florence lately, but they have a McDonald's on every corner just like we do here in the urban US. And those kids, they have the same childhood obesity problem in Italy that we have. So a really different sample of kids. These are kids in Burkina Faso who, the best way to describe it is that they are eating this full cycle form of farming. They're eating from land and soil that's very much like Eric's. So the result that they saw was that the children in Burkina Faso, the green is that Bactroidetes, it's that type of bacteria that tends to be very good there's many different species of them, but they're all, in general, very good at harvesting whole grains and greens and taking those nutrients and passing them on to you. Versus firmicutes, which is what you see a preponderance of in Florence, and this looks much more like our intestine when they sample people here in the West. Firmicutes, are, they thrive on a McDonald's meal. They're great at taking saturated fats and lots of sugar and uh, harvesting those nutrients and moving them into you. There's kind of the Homer Simpson of bacteria, you know. And so the lesson, and they also, from the children from Burkina Faso, they discovered that they had types of bacteria that we don't even have in our Western guts and that look a lot more like bacteria that they found when they took these ancient stool samples from archaeological sites, from you know, people in Mesopotamia, and looked at what their bacteria looked like. They're able to code the DNA in these ancient, the, the name for ancient stools, by the way, is coprolites, in case you're in a trivia game ever and you need to come up with that. Um, but they looked a lot more like the Burkina Faso kids. So the point here is that part of our microbiome is going extinct as we move away from these traditional soils and these traditional ways of farming and these traditional foods. We're actually losing the bacteria which are our friends and can help us metabolically. And so learning all of this, I really started to wonder, so you know, what would happen if Ali really reconnected with the farm and became you know, a piece of the farm? And um, 
I started to talk to her about this idea based on what I'd learned with Eric. And I kind of came up with this little set of rules for how to reconnect with the farm. I came up with seven ideas here for her. The first one was to eat a little dirt and bugs. And it was obviously from food that's been, been grown in an authentic and full farming way. If you eat that food from the farm that I showed you in that slide that's causing antibiotic resistance, the, the dirt from that farm that's causing antibiotic resistance, that's not going to be recommended. But eat a little dirt and bugs from a farm like Eric's, who knows what kinds of information is coming along. And someone at a talk I gave recently told me that there's some chefs that are starting to serve sprinklings of soil, actually, on the plate. So this is becoming very trendy, I guess. <laughs> but for those of you who can't stand the idea of that, fermented foods are really a chance to eat soil bugs. Have you ever thought about that? Fermentation is actually just controlled rotting. What it is is you take the vegetable and you put it in salt. And whenever you buy real fermented food, it should just be vegetable and salt. There should be nothing else on the ingredient. If you want a couple herbs in there, fine. But if it says vinegar or preservative or sugar, just put it back on the shelf, OK? It should be vegetables and salt. And what happens is that the bacteria, the lactobacillus that's sitting on the vegetable that came from where? The soil. It starts to ferment it. It does its work. And when it ferments, it multiplies. It grows. And so when you eat a little tablespoon of sauerkraut, you're getting billions of bacteria. And they're not just some bacteria that some scientist dreamed up, which is what you get when you take those probiotics. They're ones from the soil that you co-evolved with for millions of years. And so it makes sense. Those are the ones you want to get. Another pointer I gave to her, you know, we're always telling people, buy food that's locally grown, buy food from a farmer that has a face. You know, I, if you guys are busy, you don't know how to do that, you know, or you get it from your cafeteria here. Let's say you're going to pick out a piece of fruit or a vegetable. The best way is to look at the piece of fruit and vegetable and smell it. And if you can take a little taste, if it's a grape or something like that, take a taste. If it tastes wonderful and if it smells good, chances are it's been grown in a wonderful way because most of our conventionally and mass-grown stuff and stuff that's been grown for bad so through bad soil, its seed has been either engineered or hybridized to succeed anywhere and to be transportable and not perishable and all those things. It's not a seed that has been maximized for taste and for nutrient value. And taste and nutrient value often run together. So I really encourage people to actually get to know their vegetables through their nose and their mouth and not through their eyes. And when you use your eyes, look for imperfection, OK? Usually stuff that's been grown in a local and sustainable way, it's going to be a little lopsided. It's not going to look like some beauty queen that's like puffed up and been given lipo and Botox, you know, and is completely you know, the same as the next one. And the vegetables and fruits that are a little bug-eaten, that's where most of the nutrients are. Because antioxidants are basically like a vegetable's equivalent of a scab. They're the place that it goes, you know, that it actually uses to fight whatever, you know, bug or whatever has, it's, it's their immune system. So look for the cabbage leaves that are a little moth-eaten. Don't throw those outer ones away. Or if someone else is throwing them away, you go eat them. Choosing food with a story is a little different than choosing local food because we don't have all the we don't have the luxury around this country of getting stuff fresh and local the way that we can in San Francisco or the Bay Area, but choose food where there's something about the farm on the label in the store that says where it's grown talks about the farmer, because you know I was speaking with Wendell Berry who's really a nut, belongs in that food philosopher category, and he told me one of the ways that he vets his food is he finds out, does the farmer live on the farm? So much of our commercial food, the farmer's wearing a suit and working in a city somewhere, and that farm is owned by someone who really isn't even invested in the soil, whose grandfather and great-grandfather wasn't part of it, or who doesn't have the plans to keep it wonderful so they can pass it on like an heirloom to their children and grandchildren. 
But the minute that the farmer becomes invested in the soil and preferably owns that soil, they're going to take care of it like the most precious family heirloom. And they're going to give you and they're going to give their own family delicious food. Another important thing, and this is just self-evident, is to cook, because that's when you start to use these materials. And I know here you have this wonderful food served to you during the day. And I know that your chefs and your food procurers are doing an amazing job here. But when you go home, you know, use the same kind of mindfulness. And um, another important piece of it is to give back to the soil. I don't know how many of you live in a place where you can do communal composting or you have access to your own compost bins. I mean, even if you live in a high-rise apartment in San Francisco now, you can contribute to the green bins with your food scraps. Saving water, taking a shorter shower is a way to give back to the soil because any water you don't use in the global picture can be diverted towards agriculture. And connecting with nature, in the, in the book, in the fifth chapter, it's in the sixth chapter of the book, I talk at length about all these chemical connections that we have with nature and how actually there are messages when we work with plants, both olfactory messages and so on, that can make us happy or can change our outlook on things. We are actually having this sort of secret conversation with nature that we don't even realize. So just getting around nature and ex you, farming is great, gardening can be great. I wrote a chapter that took place in the Bronx in the book uh, with urban farmers and one of the researchers who's studying urban farmers found out that they were healthier and thinner even if they weren't growing vegetables just because, you know, being outside, perhaps connecting with the plants, who knows what it was. And the most important thing is to treat your body the same way as you would treat your food. So anything you put on your body or put in your house, think of it as something that eventually is going to end up in your soil. Because it will. So when you're buying shampoos or makeup or moisturizers or cleaners for your car or detergents for your laundry or your toothpaste, you know, look for all those bisphenol A's, those VOCs, if it's something that you don't want to take immediately and eat yourself, don't put it on your body. Don't put it in your house because it will end up back in your food. Um, vinegar is a fantastic cleaning uh, um, resource. I use it as a cleaning fluid for everything in my house. Believe it or not, baking soda is the best shampoo I've ever discovered. Cocoa butter for your skin. And these things have everything to do with the farm and have everything to do with your soil. And the other thing that I didn't write up there, and this is really important, is to treat your body the same way as a mindful farmer treats their soil. Because sometimes we care more about the soil than we do about ourselves, which is very interesting. So I shared all of this with Allie, and we strategized about how she and her San Francisco life could start to do this. And she actually started to get a CSA box, and she started to volunteer in a school garden, and just made more time to be outside, and made more time to cook, and started to have a different idea about how she was you know, choosing her food. And she slowly started to get herself off of those shopping bags full of medicine. Um, the one medicine, because I saw her recently, she still takes an antidepressant. But everything else, she stopped. And my guess is that the antidepressant at this point is a pretty low dose. But she holds on to it, and I'm totally fine with that. I'm an integrative doctor, and I like to straddle both worlds. But who knows what piece of the, all of this worked? Was it the subtle messages from the plants? Was it the microbes? Was it her just getting off all those medicines that were interacting with her microbiome? Who knows? Was it her just all of a sudden having a different outlook, a different view? But um, about six months after she made these changes, just like Eric, we sent lab tests on Allie. And they came back. All of her labs, all the subtle deficiencies in iron and vitamin D and so on that all those other practitioners had been replacing, they were normal. And so I called Eric and told him, and he kind of high-fived me over the phone. So we both realized that we'd done pretty much the same intervention. So this picture is just to show you. This comes from another chapter of the book. It's about raising resilient kids. But 
this is the kind of connection that other cultures have with their farms and their soil, and this kind of trust that they have, that there's real health there. And I just wanted to show you that. But thank you so much for listening. And please spread the word about pharmacology. Uh, go ahead and Facebook me. I love, I'm a, I just started on Twitter, but I've become a Twitter fanatic. I think it's this great way to learn things. And I share new studies every day because I think you can tell I'm a little bit of a science geek on top of being a holistic healer. And I love to, any new research I put out, I find, I like to put out via Twitter. So follow me on Twitter. And thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. And I'll take any questions you guys have. you have a question? So there's obviously a uh, richer microbiome in soil than in air, sort of in the rest of the environment where people live. But I know there's some emerging research in that area too about the, what kinds of microbes are in our different environments. And are you familiar with that? How important do you think that is to our health? I, I, this is so, we don't know. I mean, like I said, the ocean is another enormous source. And soil, obviously, is a very uh, huge source. I think you know w w it makes sense that the places where our food is grown is where we're going to get the most beneficial influence from that. But um, you know, in the chapter on resilience and resistance that I uh, talk about, th there's a number of researchers that are studying how farm kids have way less allergy and asthma than children who are live in urban areas. And you know, they are discovering that microbes in their unpasteurized milk play a role, that actual microbes that are just in the hay dust <laughs> play a role. A lot of the yeast that's, that they um, are discovering, yeast that even we thought were pathogenic or bad for you in these urban environments might actually be good for you. And they're even discovering that, that types of bacteria that we equate with poisoning or disease, things like staph and listeria, that in these little doses in farm environments, they're actually protective. So this is just a wide open field. And next week, I'll have something new to tell you, because <laughs> the literature is just changing very quickly. I heard Mary Roach recently talking about her latest book. And um, she was talking about um, uh, transplants of like even fecal matter into patients, that kind of thing. I thought it was pretty interesting. And I'm quite interested in the whole um, a rise and shine kind of cleansing type thing where people are replacing the biome essentially in their bodies. I was wondering if you had a, a viewpoint on people doing that. Well, when things go bad, then fecal transplants actually can be unbelievably powerful. Unfortunately, the FDA is coming down on it because it's foreign tissue and that gets regulated very, you know, it used to be sort of this underground thing that gastroenterologists would do in some weird places in the country. But now as it's getting more popular, it's getting, I think pretty soon it's going to be a very regulated thing, like everything. Um, but most of the time, we don't need to go to that extreme. Most of the time, we can actually nurture our biome by eating these correct foods. Um, but there are some instances in my practice where I have referred patients to fec for fecal transplant. But those are people who are really, really ill and where all these other things haven't worked. And the next question is, where do they get the healthy feces from? They usually get it from a parent or a family member, someone who shares the candlesticks with them <laughs> as well. So that, um, but uh, that's, it's kind of a last ditch solution. And you know, another question that I get a lot is, how about those over-the-counter supplements, those probiotics? And even people like Justin Sonnenberg, what they're really doing is trying to mine all this information to come up with the ideal probiotic, because that's where the biotech is. That's where the money is, right? Uh, you know, what I'm talking about, eating vegetables and getting to know the soil, you know, I'm never going to get rich on this. You know? I'm always going to have, you know, <laughs> sort of like, oh. Um, but uh, um, the, the, the problem with probiotics is because it, just as I was talking about, a lot of our microbiome is inherited. So yours might look very different than the gentleman in the red shirt behind you, and you know, even different from this, you know, someone in the checkered shirt here. And so, what is the ideal microbiome? We don't know. Should we tr be trying to look once again like those children in Burkina Faso? Probably, but it's going to be really hard to get back there with our modern day diets, you know? And it doesn't matter how many probiotics you dump into the system, that's just a living bacteria that needs to be nourished 
in order for it to continue to grow there. You know? does, that, does that make sense? Thank you so much. Thank you.